Well, let's get into God's Word, and um, I will give you the, the passage that I want to expound on today a little bit, a little later on. Let's pray. Father, I just pray today that your Spirit will be here right now. I pray that you will give us the, the insights and the wisdom, and that uh, your, your presence will be felt in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, will introduce this with a rather, perhaps, fictitious, but maybe a little humorous story. And the story is told of a king in a developing country who had a close friend with whom he grew up. And the friend had a habit of looking at everything in life and then making the comment, this is good. No matter what the situation, whether it was good or whether it was not good, he would say, this is good. One day, the king and his friend were out hunting, and the king would load the gun and then hand it to his friend, and his friend would aim and shoot. But this particular time, evidently he had done something wrong when he loaded the gun because as the king pulled the trigger, the gun backfired and it blew the king's thumb off. On examining it, the friend simply said, this is good. And it made the king so angry, he said, no, this is not good. And he sent his friend to jail. Well, about a year later, the king was hunting in an area that he knew he should have stayed clear of. Cannibals captured him, took him to their village, tied him to the stake, piled up the wood, were ready to set fire to it to roast him alive when the chief of that village came out to examine. And as he examined him closely, discovered that the king had no thumb. And being superstitious and never eating anyone less than whole, they untied him and set him free. Well, as he returned home, he remembered the event that had taken his thumb, and he felt remorse for the treatment that he had given his friend. So he went to the jail to speak to him, and he said, you are right. He said, it was good that my thumb was blown off, and he proceeded to tell his friend what had happened. And so I'm very sorry, he said, for sending you to jail for so long. It was bad of me to do this. No, his friend replied, this is good. <laughs> what do you mean this is good? How could it be good that I sent my friend to jail for a year? And without missing a beat, he said, if I had not been in jail, I would have been with you. <laughs> we chuckle at this a little bit, it's at the wit of this story. And I want to say that not all situations are good, but nevertheless, with if God is in it, then everything can be good. It reminds me of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says, all things work together for good to those who love God, Amen. to those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. It doesn't say that everything is good. There are a lot of things in life that are not good. It is not good when we have car accidents, and especially if people are hurt or killed. It's not good when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you, but you have cancer. And especially it's not good if the doctor says, go home and put your house in order. It's not good when there are financial reversals, when you lose your job, when people, loved ones, pass away. Those are not good. And the Bible doesn't say that it is good, but what it does say is that all things work together for good to those who love God. And that's the important thing to remember. All things work together for good. So evidently, whatever our struggles may be, God has a solution for every problem, and he has a blessing for every disappointment. If we can keep that in mind, then 
we can continue on in life. The key text, the key passage that I want us to examine today is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse, um, verses um, 20 and 21. If you have your Bibles, whether it's paper or whether it's electronic, doesn't matter. Let's go to that and let's read it. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. Here's what I want to do this morning. I want to do a little Bible study on this passage, maybe about 10 minutes worth. And then I want to tell you a story that might be about 10 minutes. We'll draw our conclusions and I'll set you on your way. Are you okay with that? Well, I guess you have Sabbath school after this, don't you? <laughs> but at least we can start Sabbath school then after that. Here it is, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pull that apart a little bit. It says, now to him. Who is the him? It's okay. This is an interactive sermon, so you can respond, and I'm okay with that. Do you know who the him is? Jesus. Jesus. God. Actually, verse 14 tells us. Let's go to verse 14 and just see uh, Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees to the, what's the next word? To the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us that the hymn is really referring to the Father, God the Father. Now to him, God the Father, who is able. Who is able? What does the word able mean to you? What other words do you think of? Pardon? Capable. Capable. Capable? Yes, he is capable. Absolutely. Anything else? Just simply other words like he can. He is all powerful. That's the same as he is capable. So, here it says he is able. Do you know that there's a song like that? Yes? Do you know the song? Yes. Is somebody willing to start it? He's able. Sing it. He's able. I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able. He's able. about God. How great his God really is. That's what he was trying to do. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Do you have a problem? Are there issues in your life that you're kind of struggling with? You don't know what to do with it? Well, 
You know, sometimes preachers will say, leave your problems and your difficulties at the door when you come to church. Just forget about that and let's worship God. And I know exactly what that means because I've said it myself. But today I say to you, bring your problem in here. Can you think of the most difficult thing that you're faced with right now in your life? Have you got it? You got it in your mind? Whatever that might be? All right. Do you know that you have a solution to that problem? We all have solutions to that problem, to the problem that we are carrying. But generally speaking, the solution contains the words, if only, if only, if only my husband would treat me better, then I would be happier. If only my wife would do this, then I would be okay. If only my employer would give me a raise in my salary, then I would meet my financial obligations. If only my kids would listen to me, then we could be a happy home. You follow what I'm saying? If only always seems to be a part of our solution. But here's the news for you. Do you realize that God doesn't say that you have to use the word if only? Here is what he says, and this comes from a book, Desire of Ages, page 330. It says, worry is blind and cannot discern the future, but Jesus sees the end from the beginning. In every difficulty, he has his way prepared to bring relief. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. So if you and I have only one solution to my problem, how many does God have? What does it say? A thousand ways. <laughs> what a great God we have. He's got a thousand ways to solve this problem, and I have only one. And even then, it includes the words, if only. So, there's a condition, though. If we make the service of God supreme in our life. He says, make the service and honor of God supreme. Well, let's keep going. <clears throat> Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. <clears throat> According to the power that works in us. What is the power that works in us? The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that works in us. He's the one that provides the answers. I was trying to think of an illustration about, um, you know, power working type of thing, and I thought about something that you may or may not understand, but I'm gonna try it out on you anyway. <clears throat> I, uh, I grew up on a farm in Manitoba. My mom and dad were farmers. And every summer, we would have to put out hay for the cattle. <clears throat> and as we did, and of course I was maybe 12, 13, 14 years old, in those days we would make these small bales. You know what I mean by the small bales? Small bales that would weigh, you know, if they were straw bales, they'd weigh about 30 pounds. If they were hay bales, they might weigh 50 pounds. And if they were alfalfa bales, then they would weigh 70 pounds. They were hard, and my dad hated bales because you'd have to manhandle every single one of them about two or three times before they got to where it really was supposed to be. Because you'd have to pick it up by hand, put it onto the, the bale rack, the bale wagon, somebody would stack it up there for you, then you would have to throw it down eventually, then you'd have to feed it to the cattle, but you manhandled every single one of them. Now it's all done by machine because they make these great big things. So my dad didn't like that. 
Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. And so, my dad says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he bought himself what was called a McKee Harvester. Now, I know that you probably have never seen a McKee Harvester. Uh, they've gone by the wayside just like the threshing machines. You don't see them around. But at any rate, it looked like a huge baler. And you would go along and you would pick up the hay from the windrow just like a baler would. And, but instead of making it into bales, it would blow the loose hay into a big wagon that would fall along behind, that was pulled on, on behind. And so it went back into that, that big covered wagon. And when it was full, then you would take this whole contraption and you would turn the big pipe of this McKee harvester into the direction where you wanted to put up this loose hay, they called it. And so you would drop the front gate and the tailgate together so that the wagon and the, and the uh, uh, McKee harvester were kind of like one unit. And then through a series of pulleys and, and uh, the power takeoff, the back of that wagon would start to push all that hay forward, and all you had to do was stand on that platform and kind of poke the hay back into the back of the McKee harvester to blow it onto the sack. You're kind of following what I'm saying here? Now that was supposed to be easier. But do you know what happens to hay when it goes through, when it gets blown with such force into the back of the wagon? And do you know what happens to the hay as that wagon bounces through the field over and over again, it packs down tight. And so my dad would say to me, you know, unload that wagon of hay, uh, of hay. And I'd get in there with my pitchfork and I would dig it in and I'd pull and pull and out would come a little tuft of hay and it would go through and then again and then again and all the time this back of this wagon was coming forward fast and what seemed faster and faster. Of course you could stop it. That was not a problem. But nevertheless, it would take me a long time to unload. But then my dad would get on that wagon you know, with me, and with his four or five tang fort, he would poke in there and he'd pull out a great big bunch of hay and it would go through. And in no time, it was unloaded. And I thought, wow, what power my dad has. How, how strong he is. And then I got to thinking, maybe that's what this passage is talking about, the Holy Spirit has all the power, which you and I don't have. So that's the power that's working within us, is the Holy Spirit power. So he says, now to him who is able to, exceed, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, it says, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to how, how long? All generations. Does that include you and me? Yes. Absolutely. This is a passage that applies to us today as well. He will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, it's story time. I'm going to need help eventually. But the story, you can follow along in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. Are you ready? Here's what it says. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Here is the story, a story that talks about a widow. Things couldn't have gotten much worse for this woman. She is a widow, her husband is dead, and you know even today it's hard for widows. It's difficult. I mean they miss the partner that they had. But widows in the Bible were even worse off. Usually, these people were extremely poor. They had no income. They depended on whatever male happened to be in the house for their support. And in this case, it was her sons. 
Her sons were her only means of support. Widows back then were usually taken advantage of. They were deprived of justice. They had no voice for self-defense. They ex but they were still expected to pay any debts that had been incurred at that time. And their belongings could have been seized at any moment, at any time, in order to pay for them. Well, that's the case of the widow in this story. There were big debts to pay. And just like creditors today, they don't take very kindly to late payments. And so they showed up at this poor widow's house, and they said, you owe us money, pay up. And she said, I can't. They said, well, give us your stuff. She says, I have nothing. Take a look around. There is nothing in my house. All the furniture has been taken away. Any, any sheep that have been in the sheep pen, they're already gone. The donkey is gone. Everything is gone. I have nothing. They said, ah, but when we look around, we see that you've got two sons. If you can't pay up, I'm going to take, we're going to take your two boys, and they will become slaves. Now, I want to tell you, that would put the fear into any mother's heart. To lose her children, not only was she losing children, but she was losing her only means of support. And I can just imagine that maybe she fell on her knees and she begged and she said, please, please don't take my boys. I will pay up. Give me some time. Give me a week. And maybe they said, okay, we'll give you a week, but we're back and we take your boys. And that's final. Now, this woman evidently had at least two things going for her. According to the Bible, there were two things that she had. One of them was that her husband had been a man of God. He had been one of the sons of the prophets. And God does not forsake his own. In fact, I don't know if maybe she claimed the promise that David wrote. Maybe not. But here is one thing that we can remember if we're in trouble. Here's what it says in Psalm 37. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Can you claim that promise too? I have not seen the steps of the righteous forsaken. God is still with us, regardless of our situation. The second thing she had going for her is that she had an understanding pastor. You know the name of her pastor? Pastor Elisha. Now, he was a prophet, for sure. But evidently, Elisha was there, and he was her pastor. And so she went running to him, and she said, and he said to her, okay, so what do you have in your house? First of all, what do you want me to do for you? And she told him the story, and then he says, well, what do you have in your house? She says, I have nothing. I have nothing in my house. It's all gone. Oh, she said, I do have a little oil. A little flask of oil. Oh, he said, that's it. That's all you need. You see, little in God's hand is much. Amen. That's what we have to remember. So she says, I have a little flask of oil. And he says, that's good. That's good. That's all you need. What you need to do. Well, let's read what he, what he instructed her to do. Um, um, verse 3. He said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. And so she did. She asked her sons, her children, to go and gather empty vessels. Now, I'm going to ask you something. We had three children that came up for a children's story. Are those three children still here? Do you want to come up here for just a second? I'm going to give you a little assignment to do. Are you willing to do this? Yeah, come. You, you can just stand in front here. Come. Come. 
And where's the other one? Yeah, there you are. Good. Are there any other children here? If there are, come on up. Now, you know what? Why don't you pretend that you are this widow's children, okay? And remember what Elisha said that, that she was supposed to do? Go and gather all the empty vessels and come and bring them here. There are empty vessels. These people over here are the neighbors, okay? They're all neighbors. And if they will look around, they may find empty vessels and you go and gather them and just bring them up here. They're basically in this section here. Okay, you wanna go and ask? I'm gonna ask people to see if they have empty vessels here and then bring them here. Go see. Anybody? If you have them there, oh, there's some over there. Come and bring them up here. Any more? Any place? Thank you. And then you can just, yeah, keep on looking. There's some more over this side too. Oh, there's some more coming. There's some more on that one there. Oh, look at that. There's empty vessels coming all over. And look what we're seeing up there on that side. Well, well, well. Thank you, neighbors, for sharing your empty vessels. Now, as neighbors, I wonder. Thank you. Okay, I think we got them all. You can stay up here and sit down here and see what we're going to do next, okay? You can just sit down there. What? And now we have those empty vessels. What was the next thing that she was told to do? Okay, neighbors, what was the thing she was told to do? Do you remember? For the oil? One thing, yes, that's right. Go inside, shut the door. Why shut the door? What did that mean to her? Anybody have any idea what that would mean? Well, Matthew 6.6 6 tells us because the people in Israel knew what it meant when Elisha said, go shut the door. If you want to turn to Matthew 6.6, 6, it will tell you what that really means. Matthew 6.6. 6. Jesus is talking. He says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Evidently, she was told to go into her house, shut the door, and pray. Now, I can just imagine that all these neighbors were curious to know what she was going to do with all of these empty vessels. What is there? They may have gathered all around her house just to see what was going to happen. And then after she had prayed with her children, then do what? Pour the oil into the empty vessel. Now I can just imagine that maybe her faith said, well, I got this much oil. I'm going to pour it into the smallest vessel that I have. And she started to pour and to pour. Now, I can't perform miracles, okay? <laughs> you all understand that. But we can imagine that what was happening when the woman was pouring this oil into the empty vessel. And pretty soon, it filled right up. And then she said to one of her children, set it aside. Come and set this aside over here. Come, come and just put this one over here. And then she said to another, oh, to another child, bring me another vessel. Come and bring one, put it up there. And so, and then she poured and poured and poured and it went right to the top. And it filled up. And then she moved to another one. Now she was in the big ones. And she kept on pouring and pouring and pouring and pretty soon it filled up until all the vessels were full of oil. And just as the last one was filling up, she said, bring me another one. And they said, there are no more. They're all full. And about that time, just about that time, 
the oil in her flask went drip, 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 and it was all gone. But now she had all of these so full. Oh, she had all this oil. Can you imagine how excited she was at that point? Just so excited. God had performed a miracle. And she went running to the pastor's house. We can read about it in chapter 4, verse 5, I guess it would be. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out the oil. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Now, verse 7. Then she came and told the man of God, and, she, and he said, Go and sell the oil, and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. Talk about, she would have been happy if she could just pay her debts. But God did exceedingly abundantly, above all that she could ask or think. She now had all this oil. Not only did she pay her debts, but she lived. She and her sons lived on the rest. Well, that's the kind of God we serve. Our adversities are God's opportunities. Paul says that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. God knows no defeat. But sometimes he uses the most unlikely means to bring about the greatest blessing. Here is the final promise to all of us. Listen, Christ's object lessons, page 172. If we surrender our lives to his service, we can never be placed in a position for which God has not made provision. Whatever may be our situation, we have a guide to direct our way. Whatever our uh, perplexities, we have a sure counselor. Whatever our sorrow, bereavement, or loneliness, we have a sympathizing friend. If in our ignorance we make mistakes, Christ does not leave us. So, I say to you, Go from here encouraged that our Heavenly Father is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen. May God be with you. Amen. Amen.